Hey guys, Filthy Robot here, bringing you another guides, tips, and tricks video. This time we are ranking the wonders of Civilization VI. So let's get the key down, let's get the definitions down so we're on the same page with that. I rank them in uh, five orders, five tiers of, uh, of power. The first uh, tier, the top tier, tier one, being the wonders consistent and game-changingly strong. Tier two, the wonders consistent and strong, or it's situational and game-changingly strong. So it's either as good as the tier ones, but it only happens a very small per percentage of the time, or it's uh, it's consistently good. Uh, decent is the wonder is consistently mediocre, or situationally quite good. Uh, tier four, the wonder is either consistently weak, or situationally mediocre. And then finally, tier five, the wonder is either consistently useless or not good, and uh, or rather situationally weak. So those are the tier lists we're gonna do. Let's just take a quick, take quickly take a look at what we've done. Um, I'm gonna leave this up for just a moment here. Uh, I wanted to get all 30 in there. Let's see if we can do that real quick. Eh, not quite. Oh man, right there. That's what I want. Okay, so 30 wonders uh, ranked for you guys in terms of their strength right here alphabetically right here, and era right here. Um, I'll briefly read them, and then we're gonna go through what they do in a second inside Civ Six. So we've Colosseum, Chitsun, Forbidden Palace, and Rare Valley, all tier one. Uh, Patella Palace, Pyramids, Petra, Terracotta, Aegea, Oxford, Big Ben, and Eiffel Tower, all tier two. Stonehenge, Colossus, the Mahadobi Temple, uh, Huey, Alhambra, Bolshoi, uh, all tier three. Hanging Gardens, Broadway, Oracle, Great Lighthouse, Great Library, Venetian Arsenal, uh, Great Zimbabwe, Crystal, Tier 4, and then Sydney Opera House, Hermitage, uh, the Estadio de Americana. I don't even know what this... I don't know how to say this. I'm going to butcher these names. I guarantee I'll butcher the names. I've been doing that for years now in Civ. I have no intention of stopping. So uh, enjoy the butchering <laughs> if you can. And then the, the Mont St. Michael over here, also Tier 5. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the ranking list for me. Um, I don't have these in order inside their tiers. So uh, it's not, I'm not saying that the Colosseum is better than Forbidden City or, the, um, or that Ruhr Valley is worse than Colosseum. These are not in order. These are just by tiers. So don't, don't take anything more out of that than what's shown here. Uh, all right, let's switch over and actually break down why I think each of these are uh, as powerful or not as powerful as uh, I've rated them. So let's move over. Okay, we're going to do this alphabetically because this is how um, the the Civilpedia has them. So we're going to go through and rank them alphabetically uh, and talk about why. So Alhambra, Tier 3. Why is it a Tier 3? Gives you a military card policy slot. Awesome. Gives you plus 2 amenities from entertainment. Awesome. Great general points. Not so awesome, but not so bad. It's available relatively early. It's available at the Castle's Technology. Uh, and uh, decent... I mean, it's a medieval, medieval wonder, so it has medieval production costs associated with it. It's okay is what it boils down to. Sometimes it's going to be quite helpful to have that military card, especially if you're doing some sort of military victory uh, or you're going to be doing a lot of fighting. And the amenities are certainly complementary to that. But a lot of times it's just not worth building because military policy card slots are not as strong as many other slots. Uh, the restriction on it, it needs to be on a hill next to an encampment. It's a pretty reasonable restriction. It's fairly easy to hit that. For me, that's just consistently uh, mediocre bonus um, or sometimes situationally strong tier three. All right, Big Ben, Tier 2. Uh, this is a fantastic wonder. Uh, plus one economic policy slot. Economic policy slots are clearly they're not quite as good as wildcard policy slots because wildcard policy slots can be used for anything, but they're still very, very strong. Uh, definitely the second best policy card slot available to you. Uh, that, that bonus is great. Doubling your current treasury is quite great. Uh, the restriction of being built uh, next to a river adjacent to a commercial hub uh, with a bank isn't that uh, impossible. Commercial hubs are almost always built on rivers, so this makes this fairly reasonable, especially if you're planning ahead at all. Um, the six gold, it doesn't matter at this stage in the game, plus six gold one way or the other. It's nice, but it's not a big deal. Same with the great merchant points, doesn't really matter at this stage in the game. Um, and it's available at the economics uh, policy. Overall, it's a pretty damn strong wonder. It's just very expensive. It comes at a stage in the game where uh, this is a lot of hammers to be spent, and this is a lot of hammers to be spent right around the time that research labs, uh, tanks, infantry, 
power plants, all those things also need to be built. Uh, so it's an expensive wonder for the timing it's in, but it gives you some really powerful abilities. Um, I, not only the economic part, but the doubling of the gold is just awesome. So the Bol Bolshoi uh, Theater here, I have this rated as a tier three wonder. Um, this is one of my favorite cultural wonders uh, because I think it's good for people who are doing things that are not just cultural victories. I guess I should have said this earlier, but I do want to say this again, right? Uh, I do want to say this right now, take a moment to talk about this. Um, it's a little bit tricky to rate some of these wonders in in uh, in relationship to other wonders because some of these wonders are very clearly oriented towards one specific victory condition. Uh, a lot of the wonders in the game seem oriented directly towards a cultural victory and don't seem very beneficial otherwise. So. A lot of those wonders are actually pretty weak wonders, in my opinion, even for cultural victories, although they're more useful there than elsewhere. And we maybe will address it when we get to there. But Bolshoi is one of these more versatile wonders, in my opinion. It's not just limited to a culture victory to wanting to build it. And it rewards two randomly chosen free civics when completed. I do hate this mechanic uh, because there's a lot of uh, civics in the tech tree that you just don't research. So, for example, if you go into um, the tier two government choice, uh, let's see if we move this. No, let's not move this. If you go into the tier two government choice of exploration, you'll probably not have teched divine right and reformed church, and you don't need to tech them to continue past the eras in the civics tech tree. So you could very easily be in urbanization with never having picked up reformed church or divine right, which means when you do something like uh, Bolshoi theater, uh, you're going to have the uh, chance that you will end up getting uh, a free tech, free civics tech that is in a very earlier previous era and therefore gives you very little culture for it. However, um, that is not all that high of a chance, especially you can uh, you can choose to tech those for maybe one turn, two turns at that stage in the game to remove them from the available options and getting two randomly cho chosen free civics techs is quite powerful. Now it's a very expensive wonder. Um, it's available at Opera and Ballet. Um, it's gonna cost you 1450, which is quite a lot to build. Um, and it does have some bonuses towards the uh, cultural victory that is the work of uh, writing and work of music slot as well as music and writer points. But you're really building this, I think, in my opinion, because it has a, both a strong bonus and has some tangential use for a victory condition. So you might you might build this if your culture game isn't that great, but the rest of your game is going quite well. Even if you're not going a tourism victory, you might still build this. I think it's a pretty solid wonder and tier three wonder. All right, Broadway. Broadway, I think, is a little bit less good. Uh, it's available um, at mass media, and it's I, for me, it's a tier four wonder. You get one free random atomic era civic boost. Boosts, of course, are half as good in the base game as getting a free tech. So this is a quarter as good as Bolshoi's bonus, since, since you're only getting half of one of the errors. And although it's not exactly that, because it's guaranteed to be an atomic era civic boost, so you might get a little bit more culture yield out of it otherwise. But you can't control what that's going to be, and often that's just not useful. It must be built on flat land adjacent to a theater square district. Um, I didn't look at the bullshit. Let's look at this. It must be built on flat land theater to, adjacent to a theater square district. Okay, so both the same uh, restrictions on build. That's a pretty reasonable build restriction. It doesn't the build restrictions that require adjacency to capitals or rivers or hills uh, are a little bit more challenging to do sometimes because those are more valuable tiles. Flat land tiles near theater square districts are not very valuable tiles most of the time. So this is a totally reasonable uh, requirement. What is it giving you? It's giving you writer and musician points as well as two works of musician slots and, two, and one work of writing slot. Um, in the late game, there is something to be said about uh, work of musician slots. They're very powerful in terms of the tourism they generate, um, and they don't, you don't have a ton of them, although you do have access to uh, broadcast centers to build a fair number across your empire. It's going to be useful sometimes when you need those musician slots, but the only reason why you're building it is for the musician slots, whereas you might build uh, Bolshoi for the culture that you're essentially getting out of this uh, to catch up in culture if you're not having a great culture game the only reason you're ever going to build broadway is because you need those slots furthermore at this stage in the game writer points and musician points aren't all that important you're going to be running a lot of um uh, projects in this stage of the game if you're trying to win uh, a cultural victory to generate those great people points very very quickly and three isn't all that consequential at this stage in the game all right let's move on chitsen chitsen is one of the absolute best wonders in the game uh, based on my rating system one of the top four wonders in the game this is two culture to all rainforest tiles uh, and one production for all rainforest tiles in this city it must be built on a rainforest is the only restriction um 
Rainforest tiles don't improve at all, uh, otherwise. You have to remove them to get any bonuses out of them, pretty much. Uh, and this takes, and but they're quite strong. Like, bananas are one of the strongest starting tiles out there. Uh, hill bananas are three food, two production, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, and regular hill rainforest is two food, two production, which are quite good tiles in the early game. This is a mid-game wonder. This is the, uh, available at guilds, which is fairly early on. And... It turns those mediocre tiles that were good in the early game, and then as the tiles got improved across the course of the game, you can't improve your rainforest tiles, they're now only kind of mediocre tiles, and it makes them really, really good again. This is, uh, the, the cities you're gonna build this are gonna be cities that actually have rainforest, clearly. So, and in that case, every single tile that you that you had that you were working prior is now basically gonna be plus one production and plus two culture. I know it's hard to say this in a consistency thing because you're not consistently going to have rainforest. So some games you are and some games you're not. And it's a little bit challenging for that because this is the tier one wonder in my mind, but the bonuses are just so incredible. This is often 10 culture at a stage in the game where you might only have 30 or 40 culture. Uh, you know, it's, it's a huge proportional increase in culture as well as production, which is the best resource uh, at a stage, at a relatively early stage in the game uh, in a controlled setting that you can, you can choose to do this with. So I, I struggled a little bit putting this as tier one as opposed to tier two. Petra is tier two and it's a really similar style wonder. I just don't actually think the bonuses of Petra is quite as good. And I think the opportunity costs a little bit higher in Petra. We'll get there in a minute. Uh, but my, my take on this is this is one of the best absolute wonders you can build if you can find a spot to build it. Uh, anyways, Colosseum. This is probably the best wonder in the game if I had to really pick. Um, it gives you two culture, which is okay, three amenities from entertainment, which is really powerful, uh, and then it gives you um, the culture and amenities that you get are extended to each city center within six tiles. Uh, it must be built on a flat land adjacent to an entertainment complex. Uh, that's not much of a restriction. Flat land is not very valuable. Uh, entertainment complexes are often placed centrally, so they don't have to be placed near your rivers. You want them kind of away from the city center, closer to other cities, because you want the AOE uh, effect that you get from zoos and onwards. This is an incredible, this is banned in almost all the games I play right now because it's so damn powerful. And it's because it's very easy to fit three or four cities within this radius in a very early game, which means this is something like, you know, six to eight culture and something like, nine to 12 amenities when right when you build this and you build this super super insanely early this is available at uh, games and recreation this wonder is unbelievably powerful uh china is pretty much the king of getting this wonder uh i think yeah yeah, yeah. china because you can rush it with the chinese builders you can't stop china from getting this wonder if they want it and it's unbelievably strong uh it just makes as i said it's, it's probably one of it's probably the best if not one of if it's probably the best wonder in the game so we're not going to do that we're doing tiers but I feel obligated to say that while we're here. All right, moving on. Colossus, uh, tier three in my opinion. Uh, the trade route capacity is a, va a valuable bonus. Uh, it's a little bit expensive at the time it arrives for that. It's uh, it's a fairly early wonder. I tend to build it a little bit later than when I get the tech. I often don't rush it because there's there's cheaper, more efficient ways to get that trade route, like building a harbor or building a commerce hub. But at some point, you'll be able to up your permanent number of trade routes by building this. Um, grants a trader, so you don't have to build the trade route after building it. It gives it to you for free, which is nice. Must be built on the coast adjacent to a land in a harbor district. Uh, that's a fairly easy to fulfill requirement, so it's not uh, much restricted. The three and one admiral point are pretty much not even part of this you're building this for the trade route as well you're building it um and in the later game it's it's mid to late game probably mid game is when you're really going to want to build this i don't recommend just rushing the tech to rush this because it's going to take too many hammers relative to the development of your city at the stage when it's first available but it's solid it's consistently solid you can you can almost always fit a colossus in in your empire uh if you're if, if you have any coastal access at all even just a single city you're probably going to get this and it's not super high con uh, con uh, it's not super highly contested uh so if you pay any attention to it you can probably probably pick that up fairly easily uh and the bonus is quite good all right Let's move on to Crystal Redentor. I have this at tier four. Um, I don't think very much of this bonus. Uh, tourism output from relics and holy cities is not diminished by other civs who have researched the enlightenment. Uh, I just don't think uh, relics and holy cities provide a very large portion of your tourism most games. Now there's gonna be those exceptional games where you find this is to be useful, but this is pretty late in the game too for this to arrive. At this stage in the game, the four culture isn't all that relevant. Uh, the must be built on hills portion isn't all that relevant. The doubles, uh, 
uh, tourism, although to be fair, hills are more valuable than flatland tiles. So being have to be built on a hill is a little bit annoying because it may remove some of your valuable production tiles. Um, and then finally, the doubles uh, tourism output of seaside resorts across your sieve. This is maybe useful. I don't, uh, the couple times I've done tourism wins, I have tried to use seaside resorts and found them very difficult to fit into my empire. Um, so having a double on on any tourism stuff is nice. That's gonna be helpful uh, for your tourism when you want all of that tourism you can get. Uh, but this is a, uh, I, I had trouble building very many of these seaside resorts when I was uh, attempting to win with tourism. So this may not be all that big of a bonus. Now you might find some situations where you can manage to have cities that just have about dozens of seaside resorts, in which case this is gonna be better, but you know. That's the restriction. And then finally, it's a fairly late wonder again. And because it's a late wonder, the, the production cost is very high. So the opportunity cost of building this is quite high. You're going to be a st stage in the game, especially if you're playing against players, where it's very clear what your victory condition is at that stage in the game. People are going to know what's going to happen. And to stop a player going towards them, one of the things you do is you kill them. So your production becomes extremely valuable because a lot of the tourism victory stuff is based on building these these wonders and these wonders are very expensive in terms of production and if you're building wonders you can't be running district projects which generate your great people which help you win the game and you can't be building military because you're building wonders and the military is going to keep you alive long enough for your tourism to actually win you the game and that's a little bit scary so um i don't think very much of this wonder eiffel tower um i think a little bit more of a, this wonder i actually have this as a tier two wonder um and that is because uh what it does, this does something for your empire that is really important. Again, this is going to be a tourism only wonder, but I think this is probably the best tourism only wonder. Must be built on flat land adjacent to city center. That's a pretty harsh restriction. Uh, city center uh, tiles are very high value, the ones adjacent to your city center. You're going to have a lot of districts placed there, and a lot of the wonders in the game are going to be placed around those areas too. So that is a bit of a pain. Uh, but all tiles in your sieve gain plus two appeal. Appeal is used for parks, it's used for seaside resorts, it's used for tourism as a whole. Um, it's it lets you take dead land in your empire that normally wouldn't be helpful and actually make it push you towards a tourism victory and lets you do that without having to settle more land. Uh, I think it's really quite powerful. Again, there's all the same problems I just talked about with building it. It does have very high um, opportunity costs, but in my opinion, it's one of the better tourism wonders to, uh, to get into your cities if you can, because it's going to let you have access to national parks and seaside resorts in places that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise, uh, which is just going to be a very, very solid bonus. Um, clearly, if you're not going tourism, it's fairly useless, um, entirely useless. In fact, uh, I guess it does boost your neighborhoods very, very slightly, but that's not, not something to consider building it for. Um, and because it is a tourism wonder and probably going to be pretty uncontested, you're probably not going to have a lot of games where a lot of players are going tourism. You may be able to build this in a second or third or fourth city, a city with decent production, but not your capital, uh, and not cripple your economy having to build this, at least potentially. Uh, so I think, I think probably the best of the tours and wonders out there. It's low tier two. If I had to put that in some sort of like uh, competitive ranking, it'd be kind of low on the tier two list, but I think it's probably the best of those wonders. All right. Uh, the Estadio do Maracana, I guess. Uh, I'm probably butchering the fuck out of that. I know I'm butchering the fuck out of that. Don't worry about it. Um, this is too late in the game to be relevant. I actually have this as a tier five wonder, one of the worst wonders in the game. And but you're, you're, you're going to be like, but filthy, you thought Colosseum was so good. And this is basically as good as the Colosseum. It gives you six culture and it gives you two amenities from entertainment for every sieve in your city. And, and the restriction must be built in flatland adjacent to entertainment complex really isn't a bad restriction whatsoever. So why so low? Because it costs 2,800 fucking hammers on online speed. Um, you could build, I think, I think in comparison, I think a stadium is like 600. I think it's the comparison. Maybe it's eight, but I think it's 600. The problem is this. Stadiums are already area of effect at that stage of the game. In other words, Colosseum is so amazing because the first area of effect amenity boost you have isn't until zoos, which is really, really late. And Colosseum is super, super early. Um, Colosseum also gives you a huge culture boost at a very early stage in the game. Percentage-wise, if you get six or eight culture at the, at the time that you have that, that's a huge boost in culture. At this stage in the game, six culture is not a huge boost in culture. And there's other cheaper ways, cheaper hammer cost ways to get this amenity bonus. This is this arrives so late in the game that you're probably probably didn't know it was in the game at all. If you're like me, you're probably like, what the hell is this wonder? Oh, I've never built it because of the requirements are ridiculous and it's so so late in the game that I don't care. And and that's what you're just gonna find. It's probably better to build zoos than this anyway. Zoos are 
area of effect to begin with. Uh, the way you place your cities, zoos are probably going to hit somewhere between three and four cities on average, which means that every zoo is, you know, what, one fifth the cost of this thing and provides. If you have eight cities in your empire and your zoo's hitting four, it's like one fifth the cost and 50% of the bonus for building a zoo. Forget, forget the wonder. And you can build zoos in all of your cities. It's just not a wonder that it has going to have any impact on the game whatsoever. All right, Forbidden City. Um, this is probably up. Uh, this is this is a tier one wonder. This is one of this is probably my all-time favorite wonder in the game to build. It's the most fun wonder to have in your empire, uh, and it's also um, probably first or second best wonder in the game. Probably up there with Colosseum. Uh, one one wild card policy slot must be built on land adjacent to the city center. This is doable. There's no flat land requirement. This is just land on the no no. It does say flat land. Excuse me. Just land adjacent to your city uh, requirement. So I. Uh, that's that's a little bit harsh that restriction uh but this is a a wonder that you're going to save that land for this is this is the premier wonder for that for that particular tile uh tile assignment uh plus one wild one wild card policy slot we know what that does is going to give you a uh, super versatile uh card slot that you can use the rest of the game it gives you five culture this is a renaissance wonder so five culture at that stage in the game isn't a huge amount but it's uh, it's still a decent chunk at that stage in the game so that's nice um Requirements, printing, uh, build costs fairly reasonable. This is going to be highly contested uh, because this wonder is so damn good. Uh, there's not a lot more to say about it. It's just wildcard policy slots are just amazing. You're, you're going to be able to use those to enhance your science, enhance your economy, uh, your, your excuse me, your culture, to enhance your production. You're going to be able to do whatever you want with those wildcard policy slots because they're wildcard slots and they're just this is just one of the best wonders in the game. All right, let's move on to Great Library. I have Great Library in uh, Tier 4. Uh, the problem with Great Library is that it comes later than its bonuses apply to. It gives you boost for all Ancient Era and Classical Era technologies, um, but you get it at the end of the Classical Era. So a large portion of the Ancient and Classical Era technologies you already have by the time you're available to build this. Um, and the rest of its bonuses aren't very good. Two Science is quite weak. Uh, even at the stage in the game that it becomes available, two science is quite weak. One great scientist point is okay, but it's not great. Uh, and two great works of writing slots. This is surprisingly the only reason why it made tier four for me instead of tier five. And that might even be me uh, not yet caught up with the patch. The most recent patch gave uh, uh, gave amphitheaters two writing slots. So writing slots are now a little bit more common across your empire than they were before. Um, the only time I ever build this, this Wonder of the Great Library is when I'm going a tourism victory and in the late game, when it only cost me like a couple turns of builds to do it, like maybe a three or four turn build, then I'll pick it up and I'm picking it up for the writing slots because the rest of his bonuses are just too useless at the time that it's actually available. I don't think very much of this wonder at all, but uh, writer slots were a little bit painful and getting cheap writing slots in the late game uh, can be quite helpful for your tourism victory so you can keep, uh, keep having areas to put those great works of writing in uh, to get that boost. Um, Flat land adjacent to a campus district with the library is a pretty reasonable restriction. It's not too difficult to do that. All right, let's take a look at the Great Lighthouse. I have tier four, I believe, for this. So let me just make sure, yeah. Uh, plus one movement for all naval units. It's not a bad bonus, uh, but naval uh, as a whole is worse in this game than it was in Civ Five um, for a couple reasons. Not only for the fact that I primarily play Pangea uh, and, that, and that's for balance reasons, so you're not playing Pangea, sure, okay, but you're going to run into less balanced games. Uh, but more because the, along the lines that because ships, because cities no longer have to be settled coastal to get a lot of the advantages of being coastal, you can still build harbors in cities that are settled essentially inland, two or three tiles away from the coast and build that harbor. Um, that means that a lot of the times having naval forces doesn't actually allow you to capture cities. So yes, you can go pillage your opponent's harbors, and then get the war penalty for being at war with them and not get the advantage of taking their cities and not get the advantage of crippling their production by capturing their cities. But a lot of the times, it's just not worth it to do it. Their, their cities are settled behind hills or inland, just far enough that you can't reach them. And a lot of times, you're just, even when you have naval access, and even when your opponents have cities that are, you know, coastal cities, quote unquote, you still can't do anything with naval units, which just makes this bonus not all that interesting to me. Uh, the three gold, the one great admiral point, I don't think are very meaningful for the cost of the build. It is a fairly early game wonder, so it doesn't cost all that much production. Perhaps in the very late game, you're doing something with battleships or missile cruisers, and you want to pick this up uh, very, very cheaply. But I don't think very much of it. I think it's worse in Civ 6 than it was in Civ 5. All right. The great Zimbabwe, I also uh, have rated this fairly low. I rate this as a tier 4 wonder. Um, again, it gives you a trade route, but it gives you a trade route much later than the uh, than the Colossus does, and it gives you a trade route uh, at much. At, it's a much higher investment in hammers to get that. 
Uh, I think it's something like double the expense because it's so much later in the era. And it's giving you essentially the same bonuses. Um, yes, you do get... Uh, you get your trade routes from the city, gain plus two gold for every bonus resource in the city's territory, and you're guaranteed at least one bonus resource if you're building this because you have to have cattle, you have to have an adjacent cattle in the city to build this anyways. Uh, but that bonus in of itself isn't that relevant. Uh, there's not that two gold per bonus resource isn't that much most of the time. You're probably not running a million cities from here. Uh, this starts to get very, very situational in a time when this is gonna be powerful. So let's say you had four bonus resources in here and you had, you remember to place your commercial hub in such a place where you could build the Great Zimbabwe and you got it and you're getting eight gold off these and then it's not too terrible, but it's still fairly late, still fairly hammer intensive. It doesn't give you the free trader immediately upon doing that. It's just not a very weak, it's just not a very good wonder. It's just, it just tends to be, so situational that it's, it's that the bonuses are going to be meaningful and if you're not getting the second set of bonuses to be particularly meaningful then you're just getting plus one trade route capacity and there's better cheaper ways to do that most of the time uh spent earlier in the game i don't think very much of this wonder it's just it's just too weird the the, the, the adjacent the cattle adjacency bonus in particular is just so so strange all right let's move on i guess sophia um for me uh this is a uh fairly decent wonder so the thing about this is it's gonna be good again for a very very specific victory condition this is a fantastic wonder a tier two wonder in fact for a religious victory and no one else cares about it at all and that makes it both better for religious victory and worse as whole as a whole so it's, it's really difficult with the wonders being so specialized in victory condition to put them contextually relative to each other. So for me, this is tier two. And this is tier two because if you're going a religious victory and an extra charge in every one of your apostles is unbelievably strong, you're going to be building a million of the apostles and you're going to be running them around for ages and ages, converting everything that you can see and you need charges for that. So that's really good. Um, the adjacency bonus or the, the, uh, the requirement for building must be built on flat land adjacent to a holy site really isn't that big of a deal. Uh, and you must have found a religion isn't a big deal at all. If you're building this, uh, it is give you the four faith, which is probably not that meaningful. Again, uh, it's, it helps, I guess, if you're building a religious victory, but it's not a big deal. It's available at education, which is fairly reasonably early. Um, so at, if you think about the way that the timing's going to work on a religious victory, first you're going to invest in. If you're not, if you're not just rushing against like low-level AI or something on a small map, you're probably not going to be able to do this to the mid-game at least, right? Because what you need to do is you need to get a sufficient amount of faith generation in your empire going, and then you need to start getting the stacking bonuses for theological combat, which requires mid-game text, uh, civics text mostly, to do that, uh, and some infrastructure in place. So at that stage, you're going to be then you could build this, and no one else is going to build this because it doesn't do anything for anybody else. No one is going to want to waste the hammers building this unless they're going a religious victory so it's probably fairly uncontested for you so all those things together make it probably one of the best wonders available if you're going a religious victory and totally useless for everybody else so where do you put that in a rating i've given it tier two man but it's it's much harder to do this in a tier system than it is uh in previous previous iterations of civ because it's just it's, these different victory conditions are kind of messing this up a little bit and the specific specificity Oh, wow, I can't say that, apparently. The uh, the targetedness of the uh, of the wonders here. So, all right, let's move on for Hanging Gardens. I have this rated fairly weakly. I have this rated at tier four, um, which is surprising because 15% growth in all cities was an extremely powerful bonus in Civ 5 and less so in Civ 6. The problem is that uh, although this is available very, very early, which means that it will be quite decent uh, in terms of the hammer cost, if you don't if you invest in this right at the start of the game, it has an extremely high opportunity cost because what happens is in the early start of the game, you really need to be building uh, units uh, for escorts and, and for claiming borders and settlers is really what needs to happen. And then you need to get your basic district infrastructure up. So this has a high cost in the early game. In the mid game, if no one has uh, bothered to build this wonder, this is gonna be a very, very cheap production wonder for you to build in the mid game because uh, the hammer, your hammers are gonna have scaled up and the cost of this wonder is not going to have increased. The problem is that 99% of the time in the early game, your uh, growth is actually blocked by, uh, by uh, housing, not by food especially if you're running internal trade routes. Internal trade routes, you're running mostly for the production, but it has that happy side product of giving you plenty of food to grow your cities, which means that most of the time, you don't need more food in your cities to keep them growing. The problem is always the fact that you're housing capped. Now, in the mid game, when you get access to, I mean, you can think of where this is gonna be better. This is gonna be better for Congo because they're gonna have those earlier neighborhoods, which means they're not gonna be housing blocked at some point. They're actually gonna be food blocked at some point. 
or amenity block potentially and it would be useful then this is going to be useful potentially i had a game as egypt the other day and i just realized how i was trying to utilize their their sending external trade routes to get the gold bonuses and there is a lot of gold on those and i was like oh this isn't so bad and then i was seeing the the problem it had in my city's growth all my cities were just not growing fast enough to plant the districts i needed this is probably better on a civ like egypt that has some reason not to be sending internal trade routes um, but most of the time, this is probably a waste of your hammers in the early game. It just probably isn't worth it 99% of the time in the early game to build this. There's going to be some exceptions to that. Uh, maybe you have a huge flat city with all the grassland tiles it wants. You might ask yourself why you planted with all grassland and no hills. But hey, maybe you built a thousand farms in that city and it can grow to the biggest city in the world. But I just don't think this is very very useful for uh, most of the games you're going to play it in. Maybe pick it up in the mid to late game cheaply if you can, but don't waste your time in the early game. All right, moving on. Hermitage. Uh, I think very little of this. One of the worst wonders in the game, in my opinion. This is a tier 5 wonder. Um, it must be built along the river. That's not that's not super painful. By the time you're going to build this, this is late enough in the game. Your borders have probably expanded out to three tiles. Uh, river tiles are more valuable than pretty much any other tile out there, so that's a little bit painful. Uh, but you can probably find a flat river tile to build this on that you don't really care about. The problem is, what does it do? It just gives you great artist works and it gives you great works of art slots. Um, in particular, the artist points at this stage in the game probably aren't that relevant. And actually, honestly, the great work of art slots probably aren't that relevant either. Uh, you get, by building uh, art museums in your cities, you get a ton of great work of art slots. I, I haven't had much of an issue with running out of places to put my artists. Now, this is clearly going to be more helpful if you are experiencing that case. Uh, but most of the time, you'd rather be spending your hammers on something else. And this is not a cheap wonder. This is 1760 production on this speed, uh, which means that... It, it arrive, it's a later wonder, it arrives late, you already have cheaper alternatives for getting artwork and art slots, so why are we wasting our time with it? Just feels like a really bad wonder for me, even for tours and victories. You might still build it sometimes, but probably, probably you're only doing that if you're already in a winning position, uh, because you probably have better things to be doing with your hammers if you're in a position that's contested for a win. Let's move on, uh, I have no idea how to say this, Huey Teokali maybe, sure, we'll go with that. Uh, plus one amenity from entertainment for each lake tile within the one tile and plus one food and plus one production for each lake tile in your empire must be built in a lake tile adjacent to land. Um, turns out plus one amenity for entertainment locally is okay. Plus one food and plus one production for each lake tile in your empire is pretty damn good. Um, the biggest problem is finding lakes. Lakes are pretty rare, honestly, and you don't have a lot of them. I've given this tier three, but man, again, it's one of these ones that's really hard to place because the bonuses are good. These are, these are very solid bonuses um, as a whole, uh, but they're kind of hard to trigger. So in the scenario where you have a lot of lakes, this is going to be amazing. I mean, it's empire wide. All of your lakes are boosted. All you have to do is build this in one city, unlike Petra, unlike Chitsun, which are, you know, city specific. This is empire wide. This is, that's incredible. Uh, the plus one amenity in the city itself isn't bad. Plus one amenity from, from each lake tile within one tile of this. So you can, you can often get three amenities out of this. Uh, I've given it tier 3, it might be slightly high, but it's such a hard one to evaluate again. Anytime I've been able to build this, and I have built it, I've been quite happy with it. Uh, but lots of games I just can't even attempt to build it. So that in of itself is almost a boost for the wonder too, by the way. If, if it's going to help you a lot when you can get it, and it's not competitive because other players don't have the opportunity to build it, that is also kind of a boost for this wonder. So, kind of a weird one to think about, uh, but I think about tier 3 in my opinion. Alright. Uh, <laughs> Again, another one. The Mahabodhi Temple. Um, I like it. I think it's quite good. Uh, I'm giving it a 3 on my list, uh, tier list again. Grants two apostles, must be built on woods adjacent to holy site, the district with the temple, and you must have founded a religion. It's a little bit... I like it because what it lets you do is it lets you take an empire that has very little faith production, and it lets you get your religion uh, enhanced all the way through, evangelized all the way through. It lets you get all the tenets possible in your religion. So... You don't have a lot of faith, you have one holy district, you did get your profit, uh, you know, you've teched up for temples because you have to have a temple to build this. That temple requirement, by the way, is a little bit annoying. Um, and you go ahead and you get two free apostles and you've enhanced your religion. And now you, you, you only have a very small amount of faith. You maybe use that to spread, to spread your religion to the rest of your cities. And then you're done with faith generation for the game, pretty much. Hopefully you have picked a bunch of passive bonuses that give you bonuses that don't require investment in faith. Although, uh, clearly, if you're evangelizing all the way, you're going to have the, the buildings. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about it in that sense. 
So in that sense, it's going to be powerful. I don't think this is particularly powerful for religious victories. I don't think that two apostles, one way or the other, are going to be all that meaningful for religious victories. Maybe the timing would be important. So maybe you rush down to, the, to this tech and you build this very early, and now you have two more apostles than you would have at this stage in the game, and that maybe is a meaningful number. Maybe you would only have the faith for two, and now you have it up to four, and four lets you spread your religion very aggressively. But the problem is passive religion doesn't seem very strong in the base game. Even if you have a lot of cities converted, it's very, very slow to take over adjacent cities just passively. You tend to have to actively spread almost all the way through the game. Um, so my, my suspicion is this wonder is decent for people who have, have some value in having a religion, but aren't attempting a religious victory and don't have a lot of faith generation and can't invest in or don't want to invest in a bunch of holy sites. I've given it tier three. I think it's fairly decent. Uh, I like it. Um, I like its versatility that uh, I could use this in a sieve that isn't doing a religious victory. All right, moving on. Uh, Mont Saint Michael, uh, I hate this wonder. I think it's terrible. Uh, I give it tier five. I think it's nearly useless. Um, all right, let's talk about it. It must be built on floodplains or marsh, which is a little bit painful. Um, and all apostles you create gain the martyr ability in addition to a second ability you choose normally. The problem with the martyr ability, the martyr ability gives you a relic when you're, it gives you a chance to get a relic when the apostle dies in uh, in theological combat. So think about this for a minute. Who's going to be engaging in theological combat? You might if you're defending. Uh, if you're if you and and relic slots, by the way, uh, they can only be held in certain areas too. Uh, so you don't have a lot of early game relic slots. You have to build specific buildings just to house relics. And a lot of times, those the places that can house relics are competing with uh, things that could that could house other things. Now. The, the people who care about relics the most are the Congo, right? They get all the bonuses from having relics. But Congo can't found a religion, and uh, Congo can't generate apostles normally anyways. They have to have some bizarre condition where other player comes in and converts one of their cities, and then they get an apostle. And if you think about what you're doing, if you're going for a religious victory, you don't want your apostles dying in theological combat. You want them winning theological combat. You're going to go out of your way to make them win theological combat from using uh, cards to make them stronger, from using government choices to make them more abundant and hopefully stronger, and from doing things like uh, microing your apostles so that they're always in a position to win because every time you lose a theological combat you lose influence for your religion in an area a large area of effect around that so if your victory condition is to spread your religion you can't afford to be losing a bunch of apostles in theological combat even if it gives you a chance at a relic and a relic doesn't really help you that much a relic is more of a cultural victory than it is a, a cultural victory tool than it is a religious victory tool so when is this going to be useful then? This is going to be useful when you have a lot of extra relic slots, which is never, and you're not Congo because Congo really can't take advantage of apostles, and you're not going a religious victory because you don't want your apostles dying with a religious victory, but you still really want these relics. So some sort of bizarre tourism victory that's based around losing, I mean, when you, when you I guess when you're trying to use the, the religious tenant that gives you extra tourism out of, out of, uh, out of relics, it's just... This is so freaking hard to find a time when I actually want to use it. And then we haven't even taken in the fact that it has a bizarre requirement, floodplain or marsh, which sometimes you're just not going to get, and it's a percent-based ability. So only some of the time which, when you're losing apostles will you get this. So some of the times you're, you've gone out of your way to generate this bizarre set of circumstances to try to take advantage of this, and some of the times your apostles still die because you made them die because you're trying to get them to die in theological combat, and you still don't get a fucking relic. you got to be kidding me. Like, what a terrible wonder. So, anyways... Oracle, um, for me, tier four. Um, Patronage of great people cost 25% less faith. Um, this does not scale for whatever reason, or doesn't seem to scale very well uh, for game speed. On online game speed, it's still extremely expensive to buy great people with faith. 25% less faith should be meaningful, but most of the time, I still can't afford it, even when I built the Oracle. Districts in this particular city provide plus two great people of their type. I think that's fairly good. Um, you're probably going to, the engineers, scientists, and uh, merchants are all going to be extremely useful. And pretty much every game you play, and regardless of your victory condition, and additionally, if you're going to add tourism, you're going to get culture from the great people, uh, the, the great writer, artist, musician stuff as well. Um, although it looks like you're only going to be getting writers for the theater square. So just writer points, I guess, which are, of course, the least valuable of the, uh, of the great people points for a tourism victory. It's, these bonuses are okay, but... They're going to come later. 
and you don't want to invest in this early. The plus one culture, plus one faith isn't that big of a deal. It has to be built on a hill is kind of a requirement. The problem for me is that it's expensive. The bonuses aren't all that meaningful in the early game. Uh, and oftentimes, even in the mid and late game, they aren't that meaningful either. Uh, I do build Oracle from time to time. I mostly build it in the mid to late game because no one else is bothered building it because it's just not worth the hammer investment early. For me, this makes it a pretty weak wonder if it's uncontested all the way across for any victory condition all the way across the game till much later. Uh, and in the late game, it doesn't even provide that much of a bonus. I, I give it tier four. It just doesn't seem that good to me. All right. Oxford University. Uh, I think this is a tier two wonder for me. This is quite a powerful wonder. It's the only percent based modifier in the game that I can think of off the top of my head here, uh, which means you get 20% extra science in the city. Um, that's a decent boost. Um, it's nice, especially if you can do an early city, like maybe your core city that got the universities out first, uh, while the others of the cities are still catching up. It'd be nice to build this. And then two randomly chosen free texts when completed is quite powerful as well. That's a lot of science potentially. Remember, it runs the same problem that Bolshoi Theater does, which is that you, uh, if you, if you haven't teched every single text. So, for example, if you're back in the tech tree, and uh, you know, let's say you're all the way up to, I don't know advanced flight right you're up to advanced flight but you didn't have any uh coastal stuff so you didn't you didn't get mil or you didn't you didn't have any reason to build spearmen right so you never had spearmen into pikemen and you haven't teched military tactics and military tactics is this stage in the game probably for you you know if you look the cost is 150 science there and flight it's and radio or uh advanced flight is 612 science there's a huge difference in the value of getting a 612 science uh tech versus 150 science tech and you can uh, run into that problem. So you gotta be a little bit careful when you're doing that, that you do your best to make sure there aren't any uh, techs that you've forgotten from way back when uh, to tech before you finish a, before you finish a, a, a wonder like uh, Oxford. Um, but as a whole, I think it's fairly strong. Uh, the, the science boost is nice. Uh, the, the double random sibs, uh, double random science techs is quite nice. And uh, the adjacency to uh, grass, grass on a plane is adjacent to a campus with the universities are really manageable uh, set of uh, bonuses to, uh, to get. So tier two for me. Petra. I'm also going to get Petra tier two. I really struggled on this one, especially with when I gave Chitsun uh, tier one. This seems a, a very similar bonus set of bonuses to Chitsun. Uh, they're good bonuses. Two food, two gold, and one production on uh, desert tiles uh, means that you're gonna take desert hills from being useless to being amazing. And you guys have probably seen my videos. I rush Petra fairly often when I have capitals that have Petra pro starts. The problem I'm finding mostly is the opportunity cost of this. Whereas Chitsun comes at a time in the game where your cities are established and building a wonder in that area is fairly manageable in terms of it doesn't cost you all that much elsewise. Uh, building Petra, especially early, is very, very draining to your game. The opportunity cost is very high in that stage of the game. It comes at the time when you're building settlers. Uh, so this is often you're choosing to make one city better in, uh, at the cost of getting other expansions out, especially if you're competing with other players for the positioning. Uh, because you're building wonders instead of settlers, you're going to lose settlement spots. And the problem is in Civ 6, unlike Civ 5, having one large city with amazing production and amazing uh, growth isn't as good as it was in Civ 5. In Civ 5, that city could carry your science with things like National College and percent-based science modifiers. That would be fine. But in Civ 6, your science is distributed. Your science is based on having a large number of cities, each with campus uh, districts, which give you a large amount of science, but it's the same amount of science per city, regardless of the population uh, in a large part, which means that this isn't quite as good as it would be in Civilization V. Still very, very powerful. Uh, still quite a good wonder. Uh, the, the, the requirements are very easy. Must be built on a desert or floodplains without hills. That's quite a reasonable requirement. Uh, the bonuses 2 to one are quite good, and it makes uh, unusable tiles usable, which is quite nice. Um, but I don't think it's quite as good as I think Chitsun is. I think it's very, very powerful, uh, but it comes a little bit, it comes early, and because it's powerful and it comes early, it means it's gonna be competitive. People are gonna go for it. You're not gonna be able to pick this up cheaply later, and it comes at a time when you need to be building other things, uh, which is the biggest downside of Petra for me. All right, moving on, Patella Palace. I also have this as a tier two wonder. I love this wonder. It's grown on me a lot. I don't actually, didn't actually think very much of diplomatic policy slots uh, for a long period of time. The bonus here must, or the requirement must be built on a hill adjacent to a mountain. Can be a little bit annoying. Uh, it's sometimes a little bit tricky to find mountains and sometimes uh, and often you don't want to give up your hills because hills are good. Um, however, 
One diplomatic policy slot right about the time you build this. I tend to build this a little bit later than I get the tech for it uh, because what I'm actually setting up for is spies. This allows me to keep my envoy production coming up at a reasonable uh, reasonable pace. It lets me run the plus two influence points uh, for envoys while simultaneously running the spy slot. And the spy card gives me uh, not only the production portion towards spies okay, but really it's the, the reduction in time it takes for my spies to complete their missions, which means they level up faster, which means I get my spies to high levels. Uh, well before I need them for things like sabotaging production and sabotaging spaceship parts or whatever else I'm going to do with them. I quite like this. This has grown on me a lot. Um, again, it just turns out that having extra uh, card slots in your governments is quite strong. And this this one, this was another car, uh, ability to do that. So pretty good. Uh, pyramids, also tier two for me. Um, I really like the pyramids. You get a free builder when completing them and all your builders for the rest of the game have one extra charge, which is a nice improvement. It just must be built on desert, uh, including floodplains, but without hills. Those tiles are useless if you're not building Petra anyways. They're they're still fairly useless if you have built Petra. So it's, that doesn't cost you a tile you care about. All you have to do is have one of those somewhere in your empire to build this. The problem is this is contested. It's a fairly highly contested uh, wonder uh, because everyone wants it because it's good. And if China's in the game, good luck. You're not getting it. So, so just be aware. Um, but it's a good wonder uh, as a whole. Tier 2, just solid. Rear Valley, uh, I think this is the last Tier 1 wonder that we haven't talked about. Uh, it's 30% production in this city and plus 1 production for each mine and quarry in this city. Uh, the requirements are a little bit harsh. Must be built along a river adjacent to an industrial zone district with a factory. Um, that can be a little bit challenging, especially if you're settling cities along rivers as close as you can. You sometimes just don't have tiles to build this. Uh, but if you can find a city to build this in, this is an amazing set of bonuses. Production is king uh, in this game. It is the best of the resources available. And this gives you a hell of a lot of it, uh, especially if you have a city with a decent number of mines and quarries. Just as a whole, very, very, very powerful wonder. Um, comes at a time where, you, because it requires the factory, and you're going to have tech factory tech probably relatively early. It's going to be an expensive wonder to build. Uh, and if you can get any of the engineers to rush it, it's going to help a lot. Uh, but it's very, very good in the late game. It's going to let you get knock out those spaceship parts or uh, some late game wonders or late game military at a much more efficient pace than you would be able to otherwise. Uh, very powerful wonder. Uh, probably one of the top, in my opinion, judging on the tier, it's one of the top four wonders in the game. All right, moving on. Stonehenge. Um, for me, I have this as tier three. Uh, what it does is it gives you a profit. You have to build this on flat land adjacent to uh, stone. It's an early game wonder. It's available super early. It's available at astrology uh, and it gives you a profit and then it allows you to found a religion on Stonehenge as opposed to a holy site. Now that would kind of be awesome, I think, if a religion wasn't a little bit weaker. If, if religion was a little bit stronger, this would be better, of course. Uh, but the other problem is Stonehenge doesn't let you build a shrine and it doesn't let you build a temple. So you can't spread your religion. You can't get missionaries without a shrine and you can't get apostles without a temple. So you can't make your religion, you can't evangelize your religion and give it extra beliefs without uh, building a holy site and a temple anyways. And you can't spread your religion without building a holy site and a shrine. So yeah, you're gonna get an earlier religion and the religions aren't, there are, there are competitive tenets in religions. Like in other words, there are some beliefs that are better than others. So getting an earlier religion is gonna be useful. But as a whole, I just don't think very much of early religions. So yeah, you can grab Stonehenge and get Defender of the Faith and uh, I, don't, I don't know, whatever whatever uh, initial belief you want to take. And that might be reasonable. That's, that might be worth doing. You know, sometimes that is worth doing. This is why it's tier three as opposed to tier four or tier five. Uh, but you still have to invest in a holy site if you're going to do anything uh, with, with your religion. If you're going to spread it at all, if you're going to enhance it at all, you still have to invest in a holy site. And that's kind of what the coolest part of Stonehenge was when I first encountered it was I thought, oh, nice. Now I don't have to waste a district on stone on a holy site. I can keep my the, the more important districts going and still get a religion. Uh, and it just turns out that you can't really do that with Stonehenge. You get first religion because of Stonehenge, but you still have to invest in holy sites. So tier three for me, not great, not bad. All right, Sydney Opera House. This is the, I think, the last of the Tier 5 wonders, in my opinion. This is terrible. Um, must be built on a coast adjacent to land in a harbor district. That's not a problem, that restriction. The problem is, what does it do? It's very late in the game, and it's a culture, it's a tourism victory wonder, right? It's All it does is give you uh, great musician points and great work of uh, music slots. Um, and but it also gives you a large portion of a large amount of culture. Like this is this is what you're paying for. You're paying all these hammers, and it's a lot of hammers. Three thousand three hundred hammers is a lot of hammers in the late game for all the reasons we talked about, including opportunity cost of what else could you be doing in that that stage of the game. And it's giving you eight culture, five great musician points, and three great works of uh, music slots. Great work of music slots are great. Don't get me wrong. This is the part. This is the best part of this wonder by far because you are going to want those great works of musician slots. Uh, musicians are very efficient at uh, generating tourism at this stage in the game. The problem is eight culture at this stage in the game is useless. It gives you another 
bonuses. You're gonna have a ton of culture. If you're going a tourism victor, you're gonna have a ton of culture. Eight culture is not a meaningful amount at this stage in the game to build it. And probably the great musician points are similar. Yes, they do help, but you're probably running uh, uh, projects at this stage in the game to generate the bulk of your uh, great people to finish up the tourism win. So I just don't think very much of it. It's too late for what it does, and it doesn't. This, this bonus doesn't make sense at this stage in the game. All right, Terracotta Army, Tier 2 Wonder for me. I think this is very strong. Um, it requires to be adjacent on... It requires to be on a grassland or plains adjacent to an encampment uh, with a barracks or stables. You often forget about this wonder because that's quite a lot of requirements. You have to build the encampment, you have to build the, one of the buildings in it, and then you have to have a random grassland or plains. It's not particularly harsh requirements. These are doable requirements. It's not like you won't have that happening in your empire, but you do sometimes forget about it. Uh, the All the archaeologists from the owner may enter foreign lands without open borders. That's a bizarre bonus. That's an AI bonus, right? Players are just going to kill your archaeologists if you steal their artifacts, even if you don't have open borders. Uh, the AI will let you, I guess, let you get away with that which is interesting but really what you're building this for is you're building it because all current units gain a promotion level um you don't care about the great general point that much sure it helps but it's not a big deal uh but all current uh units gain a promotion level is a very very powerful bonus after you've completed your first war or killed your first city state or something like that right if you have some units that are already tier one, uh, already one promotion or two promotions, getting that third promotion, or sometimes you're very lucky getting that fourth promotion uh, for free is extremely powerful bonus when you're going to war again. So this requires you've been to war, you're planning on warring again to be particularly great. Uh, but that, that scenario arises enough that I think it's still justified as a tier two wonder. I think it's quite good. All right, final wonder. Then we're done with this. Sorry this has gone on so long, but it's no real way to do this quicker in my opinion. So uh, we're going to do what we can. All right, Venetian Arsenal. Receive a second naval unit every time you train a naval unit. Must be built on a coast tile. It's adjacent to an industrial zone district. It gives you ten, two engineer points um, and is a fairly cheap wonder, honestly. This isn't that bad, 920, uh, depending on what you're doing. The problem is, of course, uh, so I guess I should tell you the rating. I have this as rated as tier 4, which is crazy because it gives you essentially the Scythia ability of getting double double units uh, from this, this, this city. Uh, uh, but although it's only naval units, and that's the problem, right? Naval units just aren't all that good for the reasons we've talked about already in this video, maybe a Pangea bias being part of it, but also part of it is the fact that uh, you can you can take advantage of the coast without having to settle in range of naval units, which means that having naval units is much less of an advantage than it ever has been before. And because you can settle off coast, that means even if you have the dominant navy, you also have to have some army so you can actually capture cities. Um, this, these, these, these bonuses are, or these requirements for building it are fairly restrictive. Uh, it's not often you want to put industrial zones on the coast uh, because industrial zones want to be adjacent to as many hills as possible. And the second you settle it against the coast, you've already lo lost half of your tiles uh, that can't be hills anymore because they're coast tiles. So it's, it's rare that I want to put industrial zones on the coast. Uh, and it's rare that I want to build a lot of naval units. And combined, that makes these bonuses just not all that strong. All right, guys. Hopefully this was helpful. Sorry this has gone on so long. Uh, but I, you guys have been asking, please filthy do a wonder tier list. So here it is, the wonder tier list. I'm sure there's a lot of wiggle room for uh, defining these, especially when it comes to the uh, kind of specific specificity of uh, the various victory conditions, which means that some of these wonders are going to be really useful for some of them and some are going to be totally useless for others. So I'm sure there are, the ratings will be all over the place in terms of what you guys agree with and don't agree with. But hopefully the breakdown of how strong each of the wonders are when you talk about how the bonuses actually apply is useful in, a, uh, in of itself. Anyways, guys, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please hit the subscribe button here on YouTube and come check me out on Twitch. And uh, I will see you guys soon. Thanks for watching.